experts are warning teens and younger kids all across the country uh, that they are in the midst of a real mental health crisis. That's right. According to the latest National Health Care and Quality Disparities Report, nearly 20 percent of children between ages 3 to 17 have a mental, emotional, developmental or behavioral disorder. And this is a real bonus here. Now we get to bring in CBS Evening News anchor and managing editor Nora O'Donnell in our Washington bureau. She's joined by author Lisa Damore. Hey there, Nora. Errol and Lana, thank you so much. That's right. We are here with Lisa Demore. She is a clinical psychologist, the author of three New York Times bestsellers, including her new book, The Emotional Lives of Teenagers. Schools and professional organizations all rely on her expertise to talk about the well-being for both kids and adults. And we are thrilled to have her in our D.C. studio with us. You are a friend and someone so many people admire. So many other mothers are excited to hear <laughs> from you today. Um, you just heard um, that that fact pointed out. Are kids in a mental health crisis today? We are seeing mental health concerns at a rate that is extreme and very concerning. So we can call it a crisis. And it's something that we need to take very seriously. And it's something that actually has more than one cause. One thing that doesn't get talked about enough is that Services for teenagers in particular are highly specialized. There aren't a lot of clinicians, people with my training, who care for teenagers especially. And so in terms of what contributed to the crisis, we saw a huge surge in distress in teenagers in the pandemic. But it's not easy for us to scale up the workforce to care for them to meet the need. So part of what contributed to the crisis is a lot of demand for care and our ability to really meet it. Yeah, the pandemic was certainly a factor in the lack of clinicians, as you point out. This new CDC study that was just released in February said 57 percent of teen girls felt persistent sadness. Mm -hmm. That was really alarming. Why are teen girls at such risk? Well, that study was um, conducted in the fall of 2021 asking about mood over the previous year. So that was a really challenging time for all teenagers. And what that study found maps onto what we were seeing clinically. Teenagers were incredibly unhappy. Now, one rule that we have long observed in psychology is that when girls are in distress, they tend to collapse in on themselves, whereas when boys are in distress, they tend to act out. So that survey asked about mood and low mood. And so we saw a lot of girls reporting very low mood. That study did not ask about acting out behavior, and it's not always clear that people report as honestly on their acting out behavior. So in terms of those questions, what we saw is that girls endorsed at a very high level feelings of sadness. But I can tell you, boys were deeply sad, or at least suffering through the pandemic, though they may have showed their suffering in a different way. And I know that's part of the reason you wrote this book, to deal with both boys and girls, because you've written about teenage girls in the past. I may also say this is incredibly helpful for adults as well. It's called <laughs> The Emotional Lives of Teenagers, but I think parents can learn a lot about it. And adults who may not even have children um, can learn a lot from this book. You say teens need two things for healthy development. What are they? Well, what they need is the um, warmth and structure that is actually what all kids need. It's sort of, if you took all of the science we've done over decades in psychology for what parents can provide at home that is more, most supportive to young people, not just loving our kids, but having them have the sense that we like them too, you know, is the warmth. And the structure is that there are rules and predictability to family life. And that really has over and over again proven to be the magic combination. Mm -hmm. It's harder sometimes with teenagers. They're not always as receptive to our warmth. They can feel like they're pushing away from us. But I think the key with teenagers is to remember that's their job. And to it's become not personal. independent. Yes. 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 And to have healthy social lives on their own. Absolutely. All to of those things are really important for kids. I have to remember that when they say, Mom, I'm not interested in talking to you or I want to go hang out with my friends. That's actually a healthy sign that they don't want to hang out with their parents. Right? Absolutely. And I think I would say the number one rule for raising teenagers is don't take it personally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, on that matter, too, when I first got your copy of this book several months ago before it was published, I underlined a lot of things and thought, oh, my gosh, this is what I did as a teenager to my parents and my teenagers are now doing to me. Mm -hmm. Externalization. How can parents be an emotional garbage can for their teens? So one of the things that is sort of unique to teenagers is that they will sometimes have an upsetting feeling. They'll get a bad grade at school and they'll be carrying it around and they'll want to get rid of it. 
And so they reach out to their parents, sometimes by text or by phone or in person, and they'll tell them something terrible, like, oh, I got this terrible test, I'm gonna fail, I'm never gonna you know, be able to function in the outside world. And the parent will try to help, the parent will try to be useful, and the teenager will cut them off or not respond to their texts or just walk away. Usually the outcome of this is that the teenager feels quite a bit better. They have dumped yes. <laughs> the discomfort on the parent, and the parent feels quite a bit worse than they did before it happened. And what we have to appreciate is that often that's actually what allows teenagers to carry on with their day. To just get it out. Just to get it out. And you pointed out in the book too, which I thought there's actually data behind that, that actually talking about your feelings, expressing them, letting them go, does their scientific proof it makes you feel better. The act of expressing a feeling word, saying I am anxious, I am upset, I am unhappy, that act alone reduces distress. And so as parents, when our kids are bringing us their discomfort, our first reaction so often is to want to give advice or make suggestions or ask questions. And what we want to remember that overwhelmingly, teenagers are just looking for empathy. I would say my number one phrase as a parent when my own daughters talk about their distress is I say, oh man, that stinks. Mm -hmm. And such a large percentage of the time, that is all they're looking for. A validation of their yeah. feelings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any helpful tips for kids who feel like they are not being heard by the adults in their life? You know, I think it's really hard because as adults, we are anxious about our kids. We are asking them lots of questions. We are often driving towards something in our question asking. And I think it's important for us to remember that more than anything, they're just looking to connect. And so if a teenager feels like they're trying to connect with their parent and it's not going the way they want, I would advise that teenager in a you know, friendly moment to say, listen, I know you're trying to be helpful with your questions or helpful with your advice, and I promise I will let you know when that's what I'm looking for, but the thing that would be most helpful to me first and foremost is just to get to tell you what's on my mind and not to have to be alone with it. You've written about this in past books as well. You have to provide the opportunities for your teens and your children's to express themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some moms I know it's driving them in the car, which is great because they'll just keep talking while they're <laughs> while you're driving them. You said one time, um, I think it's in one of your previous books, just go in and sit on the chair in their room without an agenda and just listen. Yeah. All these opportunities to let them express themselves without some uh, either direct setting where you're, you know, drilling questions into them. Mm -hmm. It's true, and, and one of the things I came across in working on this book is that it's pretty common for teenagers to rebuff all questions during the day. You know, the parents ask questions over dinner and the kids give them nothing, mm -hmm. and then to wait until their parent or parents are in bed and trying to shut it down for the night, and then suddenly the teenager is there talking, full, very chatty. And what I think is happening in that moment is that teenagers want to be in charge. They want to have autonomy. And so when they're answering questions that we've asked, we're sort of calling the meeting and setting the agenda. If they wait until we're in bed or somehow otherwise busy, they decide if there's a meeting, they set the agenda because they know that we're not gonna bring up a lot of new topics late at night. Mm -hmm. And if they want the meeting to end, all they have to do is say, okay, good night, I'm out the door. Yes. And it's pretty common. We have had a number of viewers who have written in questions. Um, Mara in Duxbury, Massachusetts writes, should we be limiting the amount of time children are spending on social media? What is the recommended time allowance? You know, it's gonna be different, but the way to think about it is not necessarily to be against social media, that we do wanna be very careful about social media, but to be for other things. And by for other things, I mean all of the things that are critical to healthy development in children and teenagers. So they need nine hours of sleep if they're teenagers, 10 if they're middle schoolers, 11 if they're elementary school kids. They need to be physically active. They need to be doing schoolwork with a focus and not just being distracted by their digital devices. They need to contribute to the family or the community, and they need to spend in time, friend, socializing time. And so the way to think about it is protect everything that is necessary for healthy development and then make sure that whatever social media is happening is only happening in the margins of those things. Betty from Cincinnati, Ohio wants to know, how can a parent persuade a teen or young adult to seek mental health care if they are unwilling? That's a good question. It's a tough one and this is not unusual. And one of the things that is true is that teenagers often worry that there's something really wrong with themselves. Their feelings are intense, they think about the world in new and sometimes destabilizing ways. 
And then when somebody says, you know, I think you should talk to somebody, it can actually confirm their worst fears. So when I need to make this case to a teenager, the language I usually use is to say, look, for all that you were up against, you deserve more support than you have. Let's get you really good support. Let's get you someone who knows what they're doing. That can break the ice with a teenager. That's really good advice. Lisa DeMora, thank you. We're going to continue this conversation, and we are going to have much more on the CBS Evening News on a, and on my uh, social media accounts as well. So, um, Lana and Errol, thank you so much, and I'll send it back to you. Thank you so much, Nora uh, and Lisa as well. Really a robust conversation. We Great all conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.